Hey everyone, how's it going? So in the last video, I ended off by mentioning that Generation 2 was 10 to 20 times harder than Generation 1 in terms of hardcore Nuzlocke's, and I wasn't exaggerating. Generation 2 absolutely taught me that I could not play the way I was playing in Gen 1. In Gen 1, it was just about my favorite Pokemon, and if they faint, that's okay. You can use many others. In Gen 2, you gotta know what you're doing. Hardcore Nuzlocke's, even without any extra restrictions, they're not going to be easy, whether you use gold and silver or crystal. And in fact, we can lump them all together because unlike in later generations, and even unlike yellow version, the major trainers all have the exact same teams at the exact same levels. The only real difference is that the Pokemon you can catch change slightly between Crystal, Gold, and Silver. I'm going to be using Crystal version for the most of this, but I also did a few runs in Silver and Gold as well, and so what we're going to be talking about is applicable to all three versions. But the style of this video is going to be very different, because after losing over 20 runs in various spots, I realized that I actually had to make a plan. Not use damage calculations, not hack in rare candies, just think about what Pokemon I want to use at various parts in the game so that I would have the easiest chance versus those trainers. I didn't need to over level too much, I didn't need to spend 50 hours, I just needed to think about what Pokemon really work. So that's what I'm going to be telling you. The strategy I discovered after a few weeks of doing this, and this should be usable, that even you, if you've never done a hardcore Nuzlocke, in maybe just three to five attempts, heck, maybe even your first attempt, you might be able to do a hardcore Nuzlocke in the game that is much, much harder than Red and Blue. So first things first, which starter should you pick? In a way, it doesn't matter. All three starters will work because there are powerful Pokemon you can catch that will help you out. But in another more accurate way, Totodile is by far the best starter. Totodile is good against the first three gyms, while the other two struggle. Chikorita is really bad against both Faulkner and Bugsy, and Totodile is even better than Chikorita against Whitney. And while Quilava will destroy Bugsy, Totodile will as well, and it struggles against Falconer with Mudslap, and it struggles against Whitney with Rollout. So Totodile it is. There's one other Pokemon though that you really should get, but you're not guaranteed to get it. There's just a very high probability. The Pokemon we want is Geodude, and there are two locations in which you can get it. Dark Cave, it's available 60%, and at night, on Route 46, actually at any time in Crystal version, it's available at 50%. But, in Crystal specifically, and I will talk about Crystal, but it's the same sort of idea for Gold and Silver, just the percentages are slightly different. If you start the game at nighttime, there is a high chance you find Rattata on Route 29 or Route 30, and if you do, then you are guaranteed a Geodude on Route 46, which is good because you also want a Zubat at some point, and you can get Zubat in Dark Cave. Typically, I got Geodude in Dark Cave. Of the 25 or so runs I did, only one did I not manage to catch a Geodude before I battled Faulkner. And if you have Totodile, you don't even need Geodude. Geodude is only kind of necessary if you use the other two starters. So let's talk about Faulkner, because he's really easy if you use Totodile and Rage. All you need to do is use a Berry, and even at level 7 or level 8, you need to be kind of careful, because according to the way I play, if you level up to level 10 after the Pidgey, you can't use Totodile against the Pidgeotto, which is why I want the Geodude. Thankfully that didn't happen, and after Pidgey hits a bunch of times with Tackle, Rage should either be a 2 or 3 hit KO on Pidgeotto. With a Berry, you should have more than enough HP unless you get extremely unlucky, and you should make it past Falconer without any losses. With Chikorita or Cyndaquil, you're probably going to have to use something like Spearow to use Growl, and then Geodude, 
Gasly for hypnosis. There are things you could do. And speaking of Gasly, you should change the time to nighttime. And in Sprout Tower, there is a very high chance you get Gasly. In fact, if you start the game at nighttime, if you catch a Rattata before, the only Pokemon you can catch is Gasly. And you need to make sure you get one. The only other opportunity, if you're playing Gold and Silver, is the Bell Tower. In Crystal, there are a couple other options, but Ghastly is integral, but not for a really long time. We're not going to use it much now, but later on, it's super great. It just sucks that it can't evolve into Gengar, and it doesn't get any useful special moves. That's right, Ghastly cannot learn Fire Punch, Thunder Punch. In later generations, I believe it can, but not in Generation 2. Alright, so after we beat Falconer, the level cap increases to 16 and we can battle Bugsy. Now, in Union Cave, there are no repels. You're gonna get an encounter. Here is where you would get Geodude or Zubat if you didn't. I mean, you don't have much control. You can get Sandshrew, you can even get Wooper, I believe. I'm gonna be honest, none of those Pokemon are strictly necessary for the late game. You really just want to have for Bugsy your Totodile as well as your Geodude. And you can have Ghastly. Heck, I even leveled up a Pidgey. I actually did not set the time to nighttime. I went to daytime. Was a little riskier for Geodude, but it was okay because I had Totodile. And that should be good versus Bugsy. Again, you need to make sure you don't level up, but Totodile can completely destroy Bugsy with Rage. The Metapod or Kakuna, the Kakuna can poison you and that would be bad. And if that happens, you want to switch to Geodude and make sure your Geodude is at least level 11 because it learns Rock Throw. And if your Geodude is like level 14 or 15, heck if it's level 16 too, it will one-shot Scyther with Rock Throw. It'll one-shot all three of them with Rock Throw. So Bugsy is not difficult if you have Geodude. If you don't have a Geodude, that's very unlikely. There are so many ways you can catch it at this point. There is also the chance you caught a Bellsprout on Route 31, and you could trade that for Onyx, but I don't recommend using Onyx. It is just a worse version of Geodude. But with either of those two Pokemon, Bugsy is easy, of course. If you started with Quilava, Bugsy is easy. And if you somehow needed to, you could train one of the many bird Pokemon, whether it be Hoot Hoot, Spearow, or Pidgey. Bugsy should not be too big a deal. Rival 2 does tend to be a little more difficult, but if you have one of those bird Pokemon or flying Pokemon that I referred to, it should be easy because Ghastly can't actually hit a normal Pokemon. So if you use Gust or Peck, you should be fine. The rival Zubat can be defeated pretty easily by Ghastly if you've leveled it up or by Geodude. And the Bayleaf could be walled easily by Zubat, but I actually don't recommend leveling up Zubat. I do recommend getting a Zubat Preferably either in Slowpoke Well or Union Cave. It doesn't strictly matter if you got one in Dark Cave. That works as well. Just don't get one on Route 36. You really, like you can, but you shouldn't for reasons we'll talk about in a few minutes. It's just going to make something a lot more tedious. And listen, even in Nuzlocke, we don't want things to be tedious. That said, even though I focused on the Pokemon that are most important, there is nothing wrong spending a little bit of extra time battling some extra trainers and leveling up some other Pokemon like Bellsprout, Spearow, Rattata. All of them can be useful in the early game, and Nuzlocke's are about pivoting, transitioning from better Pokemon to even better Pokemon. And if something goes wrong, and this is the most important part, if something goes wrong, you need to have a way to recover. If you rely on, oh, I'm just going to use Geodude against Bugsy and something goes wrong, you keep missing with Rock Throw, you're going to lose. If you have a backup, that works well. It's why I actually go for Totodile first and use Geodude as a backup. The last thing you want to have happen is lose the Pokemon you were intending to use and then it all snowballs and the run is over. Like I mentioned before, if you black out, the run is over. So spending a little bit of extra time in the early game getting your quote-unquote useless Pokemon to higher level, it's just good strategy. After you beat Rival 2, we then head through Ilex Forest. It doesn't matter what you catch here. We're going to head to Goldenrod. Now, in Gold and Silver, this is actually a little bit easier. In Crystal, I recommend being nighttime because if you've played at nighttime the whole time, 
you're more likely to get an Abra. And you absolutely need Abra. You don't necessarily have to catch it on Route 34 or 35, but you want an Abra. And if you don't get it here, which I never did, you would have to buy it at the game corner, which is fine and it's safe, but it still counts as your one encounter in Goldenrod, meaning you can't get Eevee, and Eevee can evolve to Umbreon, which can make things a little easier. Honestly, it's not even that necessary, but a Dark-type Pokemon walls Psychic-type moves really, really nice, and Umbreon is really good defense. However, Abra is the Pokemon we are aiming for here. There are other useful Pokemon you can get, the Odd Egg can hatch into Smoochum, Elekid, very good Pokemon, but unfortunately, if they're not shiny, they have zero DVs, which is why I didn't like using them. Heck, you can even get Raichu with Thunderbolt. I did use Raichu, I did use Jinx, and even with zero DVs, because of either Thunderbolt or Ice Punch, they are useful. It's just, there are other Pokemon that are even more useful. Speaking of which, another Pokemon that's pretty useful is Nidoran Male. In Gold and Silver, it's available on 34 and 35. In Crystal, it's available at the National Park and only at the National Park, but not at nighttime. So you're going to need to switch the clock. Thankfully, in Gold and Silver, you just have to press it B, select, and down in order to do that. And then you need to know your money, your trainer ID, and just find a calculator online. Known about this forever. If you're playing Crystal, it's a little more complicated. You start by pressing B, select, and down. You let go of B and down, hold up and left, and then let go of select. It sounds a little complicated. It can take a little bit of time to get used to, but eventually you'll get the hang of it and you can change the clock. If that feels like cheating to you, you can just wait until the next day. But yeah, it's got to be not nighttime in order for you to catch an Nidoran. But it's not integral. I caught Sunkern, which is awful and what I didn't want. But what can you do? It's not a big deal. Nidoking is a very good Pokemon and is one of the options I had for late game, but it's not necessary. In fact, I have an exact team in mind for late game. All Pokemon we can ensure that we're going to catch. So don't worry. You can follow this exact same blueprint and guarantee the exact same Pokemon, thanks to the no duplicates clause. Sometimes it's bad, especially if one of these Pokemon were to faint that we don't have a backup, but it's also good in ensuring we actually will get to use these Pokemon. So far, I'll have you know, almost none of the Pokemon you're seeing me use in most of the footage are Pokemon that are gonna be on the final team, if you can believe that. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. To prepare for Whitney, we're gonna level up Kadabra, it's not going to be used. Ideally, once again, Croconaw and Geodude. Sucks that it can't evolve into Graveler. I almost said Graveler. But because the level cap is 20, you're going to be stuck with Geodude. And Croconaw should be all you need. Why? Because Clefairy likes to use Double Slap. And Double Slap, if you use Rage, each individual hit of Double Slap powers up Rage. And you can get crazy powered up Rage to the point where you can two-shot or three-shot Miltank. Even with Rollout, it doesn't start off strong enough to knock out Croconaw in just two hits. You should be able to outspeed, and thus, you should be able to knock out Miltank. If you're unable to knock out Miltank for some reason, Geodude can tank a couple hits, but it might need to be sacrificed. And your other Pokemon, whatever isn't Kadabra, Croconaw, I mean, you can sacrifice Croconaw, in fact, because this is the last time we're really going to use it, if you can believe it. The reason I level up Kadabra, by the way, is in a pinch, Kadabra can come in after a Pokemon is fainted and use Confusion to hopefully knock out Miltank, assuming it's not at full HP. So it's what we call the Revenge KOer. Most of the time, however, Croconaw should be sufficient on its own. And even if you don't use Croconaw, typically Geodude will be good but it does depend on if Magnitude cooperates. Sometimes you just get Magnitude 4 after Magnitude 4. Rollout starts to build up power. That really sucks. But typically, Croconaut should be enough with Kadabra as a backup. If you have Nidorina with Double Kick, that works well as well. So now we've made it past Whitney. 
And we have some Pokemon we're going to use. But finally, when we get to Ecrateek, in fact, we're going to get to Olivine because as soon as you get to Ecrateek, you can make it all the way to Olivine. Our team is going to start to come into focus. We're going to need a couple Pokemon. One of them we're not guaranteed, and the other one we pretty much are. One of them, shockingly, is Magikarp. We're going to want a Gyarados, which is surprising. In Generation 2, Gyarados isn't really that good. Its special attack is terrible, doesn't have a great move pool, and you'd think there are plenty of other better water types, and I'd agree, there are. But Gyarados is very, very good at being big, bulky, and powerful with physical attack. Even though there are better Pokemon, matchup-wise, Gyarados is going to serve a very, very useful function. So it is going to be on the team. With the good rod, you can easily catch it at level 20. You could catch one earlier with the old rod, but then you have to train up a Magikarp. That's no fun. With the good rod, there is a rare candy available in the lighthouse. So you don't have to train up at all. And it can learn Headbutt. So right away, you have a useful Pokemon at level 21. Four levels away from the level cap, which is 25. The other Pokemon we're going to try to find is Chinchou. Now, Chinchou or Chinchou, don't know how to pronounce it, but it doesn't matter because it's not a high probability. It's about 20% at the harbor, but most likely we're going to catch it in Newbark Town. Now, I know some people consider the starter to be your encounter. However, the rules of the Nuzlocke state that it doesn't start until you receive Pokeballs, so I have never counted the starter, especially when you get to Generation 3 and you receive the starter on Route 101, or in Generation 4, when you receive it on Route 201, I still believe the encounters are fair game. I mean, everyone has small variations in their Nuzlocke rules. In no way do I think it compromises the integrity of the run or something ridiculous like that. But typically, you won't find Chincho until you go back to Newbark Town. And I'm not going to do that until I defeat Morty. In terms of defeating Morty, I've talked about Pidgey or Spiro. Spiro, by the way, is way better because you can evolve it into Firo. But that's what I'd recommend using, because like we talked about with Rival 2, none of the ghosts can really directly damage. They can use Mean Look and Curse, and this is why Spearow is better, because it can use Peck, and it has Firo at least, much higher attack. However, I didn't have a Spearow, I had a Pidgeotto. And as you're going to see in this battle with Morty, it was fine. In fact, this was one of my best runs. I'd only lost one Pokemon, a Bellsprout, I had to sacrifice when I beat Rival 2, and unfortunately Pidgeotto is not going to make it. But just like as we talked about versus Whitney, this is where Kadabra comes in, it's fast, it's super effective, it might not one-shot with Psybeam, so you don't want to use it against Gengar at full health, but once Gengar is even partially weakened, it will one-hit KO both Gengar and Haunter. If Gengar attacks, it's going to use Shadow Ball, and it's going to obliterate Kadabra. So do not do that. In fact, this is a pretty good time to talk about why Kadabra is so good. You might have already seen its moveset, but Kadabra can learn Ice Punch, Fire Punch, and Thunder Punch. So even though Psychic types were nerfed pretty hard in Generation 2, they're now immune to Dark types, at least offensively, and... Special Attack and Special Defense are separate stats, making Kadabra a lot less bulky. The ability to have all that coverage is amazing. It's part of what makes Nidoking so good. It's what makes Hypno not terrible. The ability to damage pretty much anything, it makes Kadabra an insane sweeper. Pretty much every remaining gym leader can be obliterated by just Kadabra. We do want to be a little careful with some of them because it might not be a 1 a KO. But, Kadabra is such a useful option. So yeah, Morty isn't too big of a problem. You have a lot of different choices. Chuck can be. Once again, Kadabra can just destroy Chuck. But if you're worried about potentially losing Kadabra to Polyrath Surf or even Dynamic Punch, I got good news for you. There are other Pokemon we can acquire very easily that do the trick. One of them being Gyarados. Now, you can catch Red Gyarados, but Red Gyarados is very scary. Thrash destroys most of your team, and Thunder Punch isn't good either. Don't forget, the level cap for Chuck is 30, and for Price is 31. Even though Price is technically the 7th Gym Leader, I battle him 6th, because Jasmine Steelix is at a higher level, 
so it keeps the level cap always increasing, which is what I want. But yes, at level 30, battling a level 30 Gyarados can be scary as heck, so I don't recommend doing that unless you're very certain you're going to win. Instead, there are many places where Magikarp can be caught with a good rod at level 20. It does mean it won't know bite, but it doesn't need it. You can teach Headbutt, you can teach Surf, and Gyarados is ready to kick some butt. Even with its bad special attack, the same type boost from Surf is good enough for rock types, which is what that is needed for, but realistically, it resists fighting, it is immune to ground, it is a great pivot Pokemon, and we're going to get another Pokemon, Lantern, which has electric typing. It actually knows a decent electric move in Spark. Magnemite doesn't learn anything better than Thundershock. Not even Thunder, unless you want to spend time at the game corner, which I do not. And so it's going to be our electric type that also can know Surf. Our final Pokemon we're going to wait on. There are other options, but I'm going to spoil it. It is going to be Seal. But you can't get Seal until you can use Whirlpool, and you can't use Whirlpool until you defeat Price. I also advise you to start leveling up your Zubat and to make it a Crobat. If you're playing in Crystal version, take note of where you caught Zubat. If you level it up there, Union Cave being the best spot, then you can have a Crobat much, much faster because it gains more friendship points for gaining a level in the area in which it was caught. So Kadabra, Crobat, Graveler, Gyarados, and Lantern. Those are five of the six. And once we get Seal, we will have our team that we are ready to destroy Johto with. And I do mean destroy. What's so awesome about this team, if you look into it, is even with Nuzlocke rules, you can guarantee each and every one of these Pokemon. There is not a single one that is not guaranteed and while in some runs they'll have better stats than others and in some runs something might go wrong and you lose them which is okay there are backups you are guaranteed to have an optimal team for johto pretty much every single time which i really like for a video like this anyway for chuck you have a bunch of options you can use gyarados headbutt if you want to you can lead with kadabra and try to knock it out with your psychic attacks it really is up to you Kadabra can potentially one-shot Polyrath, but it's unlikely. Polyrath's Dynamic Punch shouldn't one-shot Kadabra unless it's a critical hit. So it's usually fine, but if stuff goes wrong, Gyarados is more than able to destroy Polyrath. Polyrath has nothing to damage it. And if you really need to, Crobat, if you have one with Wing Attack, that can do the trick as well. So there are many, many options available to you. It's just about picking the right one. Once we get past Chuck, we then have to do the Team Rocket side quest. One thing I will say is there is a Team Rocket member with a coughing. It can self-destruct. Be careful. Weaker Pokemon don't do well against self-destruct, so try not to use a Pokemon. It's the trainer on the second floor where you get the two passwords. The Grunt doesn't have a name, but it's the first trainer you can fight, and I believe he's optional. But I battle everyone because you're going to need to level up. Price is also exceptionally easy. If you want, you can catch a seal, but I don't recommend using seal because it won't be dugong. You can use a combination of Lantern and Gyarados. They do a pretty good job. I mean, if you're using other Pokemon, Hypno with Fire Punch and Thunder Punch, Kadabra as well can do the trick. There are many, many, many options. After you beat Price, you can then go to level 35, and that's when you can defeat Jasmine. Jasmine, as long as you have a Pokemon with Dig that outspeeds Magnemite, that's two down. Steelix can be really annoying. Iron Tail, it does miss 25% of the time. Very powerful. Another reason Gyarados is so useful. Kadabra's Fire Punch might be able to one-shot. Probably not, unless you got really lucky in a lot of different ways. I strongly recommend just using either Lantern or using Gyarados they will make it easy as heck. There is almost nothing Steelix can do to them. And then, of course, against Magnemite, you can use Kadabra. If you have Nidoking, you can even use Double Kick. That will do the trick because they can't really do anything. Watch out because they like to use Thunder Wave and Supersonic. So they can be a little annoying. But yeah, if you have the right Pokemon, Jasmine herself is really, really easy as well. That doesn't mean you can't lose. 
If you don't have a ground Pokemon, the Magnemite do know Thunderbolt, which they shouldn't be able to learn, so that's really bad, and Steelix can be an issue. In terms of losing runs, I did lose a run to Jasmine. In fact, I think I've lost one to every single gym leader. It really is about knowing your Pokemon and knowing your backups. And like we've talked about, Hypno is a pretty good backup. Cloyster, although crystal only because you can't get a Water Stone prior to the post game in Gold and Silver. Solid backup. Tentacruel is a solid backup. There are many, many, many options. And I do recommend using water types because there are just a lot of Pokemon weak to water and a lot of moves that don't do great against Pokemon with high special defense like Tentacruel. Lantern doesn't necessarily have high special defense, but its HP is good and Gyarados has pretty good bulk as well. This is going to bring us all the way to Claire. And here's where I want to talk about something. This is something that's really difficult to decide in a Nuzlocke. And what you need to decide is when to level up your Pokemon. Gyarados is easy, right away. Some Pokemon are not as easy. You might have gotten Smoochum from the Odd Egg, and if you did, Smoochum's one of the Pokemon that leveling it up right away and having it evolve into Jinx isn't the best idea. Because Jinx cannot learn Psychic via level up, but Smoochum can. Unfortunately, it's after when you can already evolve it into Jinx. So do you delay the evolution and have a weaker Pokemon or do you just evolve it and forgo Psychic? Unfortunately, what would happen to me is I would delay evolution and then Smoochum would faint. And this is the key thing. Leveling up without rare candies, because this is all assuming you're just using a vanilla cartridge, probably one you have lying around from since you were a kid. If you do that, there is a risk of you fainting to just random Pokemon sometimes. This happens all the time. Unless you're really, really careful and you know the game super well, you might think Ice Punch one-shots Graveler and whoops, self-destruct. There goes Smoochum. It's really bad. Actually, I think it was a rock throw, but I don't really remember. It was so many runs ago. I did a lot of runs. The way to avoid this is just being smart. Delaying evolution only when you have to. So for example, Seal evolves at level 34, but it learns Ice Beam at level 37 if it's Seal, but after level 40 if it's Dugong. And that means I wouldn't have Ice Beam for Claire. And Ice Beam does a really good job versus Claire. So this is an example where I think Seal Surf is good enough to knock out the Graveler on Route 45. In some games, there's also Dawn Fan there. And so I don't mind delaying the evolution and having Ice Beam. But some cases we're going to talk about it isn't worth it. And you're just going to lose the Pokemon. So keep that in mind. Now, the optimal strat for Claire is Ice Beam, Ice Beam, Ice Beam, Ice Beam on Kingdra, Hyper Beam you should tank if you leveled all the way up to 40, and you should be able to knock it out before it moves again. If something goes wrong, I would recommend using Gyarados as fodder and Revenge KOing with Kadabra. If you don't have Kadabra, or if you're using Jinx, again, Ice Punch, Ice Punch, Ice Punch, however... The issue then becomes Jinx cannot withstand a Hyper Beam, so I'd recommend swapping into something that can. Cloyster, for example, can be good. The problem with Cloyster is it cannot learn Ice Beam. It's not a TM and Shelter doesn't get it until almost level 50. Aurora Beam does work. However, Surf actually does quite a lot of damage. Cloyster has horrible special defense. I really do recommend Dugong over Cloyster. Lapras can work, by the way. Why not use Lapras? The issue with Lapras is that it's just impossible not to get an encounter in Union Cave. You don't have access to Repel, so there's no reality in which you delay the encounter, unless you get obscene luck that is pretty much like you're playing a tool-assisted run. So, Claire shouldn't be a problem. I actually think she's one of the few I rarely lost to, just because there's so many Pokemon with Ice Punch. If you want to level up a Hypno as backup, by the way, Hypno does an exceptionally good job because it's very bulky. It might not outspeed, but it can use psychic moves instead of the ice moves. So I would strongly recommend something you don't mind fainting if you're worried. But Dugong, Lantern, Gyarados should have enough bulk that you should be good every single time. And this brings us to the lead four. And the real reason I have this team is not for Claire. It's not for the random trainers. It's for the elite four. 
So when you're building a team, and trust me, I plan on doing some more runs in Crystal in the future, you need to think about what each Pokemon is going to do against the Elite Four. Our team is very well suited. Kadabra does a really good job against Will because Will's best move are Psychic moves. And even if it didn't, Dugong, Lantern, Gyarados, they all can do pretty well, and they have enough bulk to withstand attacks. So Will is covered. As for Koga, Kadabra destroys. Fire Punch, Psychic, bam. Nothing to worry about. Next, we think about what are you going to do versus Bruno, Kadabra, Gyarados for Earthquake if that happens, Lantern to avoid a Rock Slide. It's really good. And Karen, honestly, Graveler does pretty well here. Crobat can help. And then we finally don't have to worry about Lance. Kadabra leads with Thunder Punch, Ice Punch, Ice Punch. You swap out for Aerodactyl into Lantern. Lantern can tank, and then you can even use Dugong, or you can use Gyarados and knock out the final Charizard and Dragonite. It is so consistent. But why am I not showing you the battles? Why am I just showing you walking around? Because far more time is going to be spent leveling these stupid Pokemon up. The level cap is 47, and this is by far the worst part. And this is why people use Rare Candies, by the way. It's so boring. You're going to spend at least half an hour, and if something fainted, way longer. See, that's the thing why when something faints, it sucks. Kadabra faints, let's say, a Claire. Something went wrong. That's really annoying. Now I got to level up my Drowsy, which is only level 12. Oh no, Gyarados fainted. Am I going to use Tentacruel? Am I going to use Cloyster? Am I going to use maybe Goldeen? No, don't, don't do that. But you know what I'm saying? That's the real problem is that when something faints, you need a backup. Now, funny enough, I was deciding between my rock type, you can either use Graveler. And the reason why I like Graveler, it's a swap in for Hyper Beam. It's a swap in for Rock Slide. It can destroy Aerodactyl. It can also destroy Charizard. And it knows a decent rock move. Unlike Rhydon, the only rock move it could learn is Rollout. So I'm going to save Rhydon, which is the Pokemon I caught in Victory Road because you can manipulate that. It's either Sand Slash, but I actually already got a Sand True, or Rhydon, and that's going to be super useful for Kanto. And this is something else we need to talk about right here, right now. Before you battle the Elite Four, please note the level cap drops to 39 after you beat these guys. I would start consistently getting past Lance, only to have my team get absolutely destroyed in Kanto. Because I really only level up the six Pokemon I'm using. I don't really think about, oh, what if I need a backup? I worry about that if I need a backup. But in Kanto, you need a team to actually battle things. There are trainers with decent level Pokemon for level 39. And while you can catch new Pokemon to replace your old ones, you're going to need a useful team. So I recommend Haunter, which should be lying around. It can avoid... I mean, for Janine, pretty much avoids everything risky. Rhydon, if you want to teach it Earthquake, that's a really good idea. It can now be a very bulky Pokemon. If Croconaw is still available, you can level up to Feraligator, Slowbro. Just have a couple things. We're going to catch more things in Kanto, but we just... It sucks. It really sucks that you need to not only level these guys up to, I do 45 just to give myself some leeway, but the level cap is 47 until you beat Karen. Yeah, it, it really, really sucked. Anyway, I guess I can show you the battles now. I will talk about, as I show you the optimal plan, some backups. So for Wheel, the best backup isn't even a backup. It's actually the best strategy, Umbreon. Umbreon is the only dark Pokemon you have access to prior to Kanto. But I really recommend Kadabra over Umbreon. Unfortunately, Umbreon's move pool just without foul play, which I don't think exists till Gen 6, it's just not worthwhile. So the way I would get an Umbreon is if I happen to encounter an Abra on routes 34 or 35, and I put it to sleep or caught it, which is good because it can teleport away, I would then get the Eevee in Goldenrod City, give it a whole bunch of haircuts, which takes a really long time. And then I'd have an Umbreon, which should know either bite if I delayed evolution or faint attack. 
And that will annihilate. I mean, even Return would do a lot of damage. You can teach Shadow Ball. It would annihilate well. And it's a very good bulky Pokemon. If you don't have either of those, I mentioned Drowsy slash Hypno. That does a really, really good job. There is a slim, slim chance you can get Sneasel. So I take that back. There's another dark Pokemon you could get, but Sneasel is kind of frail and very unlikely you acquire it. Other than that, I mean, Jinx can do a pretty good job with swapping to Lantern. Jinx can beat Zatu. Uh, there are lots of options for Will. Against Koga. If you have a Growlithe and Crystal, evolving it to Arcanine, not a bad idea. It takes forever for it to learn Flame Wheel or, heck, Flamethrower. So you might want to evolve it before then, but it could do a pretty good job. Again, Hypno or Cadaver with Fire Punch. Probably your best option. Needle King, very good option with Earthquake, Fire Punch. Really, really works. Ice Punch or Thunder Punch for Crobat. There are lots of really, really good, easy options. For Bruno, Water Types. I don't know, Gyarados does a good job. You have to worry about Rock Slide. For Alligator, would absolutely destroy. I've never used one, but it would if you want to use your starter. You can also do a lot of swapping right? You can swap to Crobat for the fighting moves. There are many, many, and numerous options. Bruno's still pretty easy. And so is Karen. She's difficult in a solo run because she likes to status your Pokemon but with the ability to switch. The one thing you got to be aware of is Houndoom does a lot of damage. So it can do pretty decent damage even to something like Lantern, but a good water type, a Surf, an Earthquake should one-shot. You just have to make sure your Pokemon is around half or three quarters HP just in case but we already really talked about Lance ice moves like ice punch ice punch ice punch you want a Pokemon with Thunder Punch so if you're playing gold and silver Ampharos really really good versus Lance because it learns Thunder Punch unfortunately it is slow Graveler slash Rhydon completely walls both Charizard and Aerodactyl and then you just need to make sure you outspeed the Dragonites, and Ice Punch should, on most Pokemon, be a one-shot. You have Cloyster, Ice Beam, or Aurora Beam should do the trick. Dugong. Icy Wind I don't recommend, because it's only 55 base power, oftentimes not being used by a nice Pokemon. I don't recommend Piloswine, it's just too slow with too low special attack. And Jinx works, Jinx works. Nidoking, heck, Nidoking works. What makes this Elite Four so good is that they really just don't have a lot of diversity in their teams. So a single Pokemon is usually good enough to knock out the whole team. This isn't the case in later games and is why Gold and Silver is sometimes considered a really easy Nuzlocke. I don't agree because after you do that, you have to head to Kanto. And in Kanto, we're now thinking about Red. That's the game. Blue is pretty tough, but Red. Red has six of the toughest Pokemon, and I don't want to level up to level 81. So, first off, make sure we have those Pokemon. You have to deposit your whole Hall of Fame team. Hopefully none of them fainted, because you're going to want to use some of them again. Shockingly, not a lot of them. But we're going to start catching some new Pokemon, and they're very easy to manipulate as well. So the Pokemon we want... Actually, the way I should think about this is let's talk about Red's team. He leads with Pikachu. The best Pokemon are either Rhydon or Graveler. Losing that, Sandslash, which you can catch in multiple spots if you haven't, Nidoking and Nidoqueen, which you can catch in multiple spots if you haven't already. There are Moonstones available either by having your mother save money, there's one in Tojo Falls, so those are all the best options for Pikachu. Not too bad, but the benefit of using a Rock-type Pokemon is that while Pikachu doesn't get Iron Tail like it does in the anime and in HeartGold SoulSilver, it does have a normal type attack, so you don't have to worry whatsoever. Alright, the next Pokemon we're going to think about is Espeon. The order Red sends out his Pokemon is, it's not random, it's based on what you have out there. So Espeon is walled pretty heavily by Dark types. There are two different Dark types you can get. Murkrow, which is very easy to get and you need to get if you want to manipulate a Houndour. Houndour is only available on Route 7 at night, but Murkrow is available on Route 16. The only other Pokemon available at night being Grimer, which is available in the lake in Celadon City, or the little puddle. I don't know what that's supposed to be. But in front of the house where you get soft-boiled in red and blue. So, 
I would use Houndoom because it's better and more fun to use, but Murkrow is an option if you're Houndoom faints. Remember who I said delaying level up's not a good idea? Yeah, we're gonna have to use these Pokemon in Kanto. So experience share can help a little bit, but like they're gonna have to actually do stuff. And Houndour is, or Houndour, however you pronounce it, it's really, really frail. So as soon as it can evolve to Houndoom, yeah, it's not going to get Flamethrower or Crunch as early. Who the heck cares? Evolve that puppy. Okay, the other Pokemon we got to think about is Charizard. And on Route 16 and 17, you can guarantee a Slugma, which evolves to Macargo, completely walls Charizard. Wing Attack, not very effective. Flamethrower, double not very effective. Heck, it's even decent against Venusaur, but Macargo... Super, super great. So right now, just to recap, we have Graveler or Rhydon, Houndoom or Murkrow, and then Macargo. Uh, if Macargo faints, it's not great. There are other things you could use. I mean, Tentacruel works. The problem with Tentacruel is Wing Attack will still do decent damage. You could use something like Rhydon, but Flamethrower will do a lot to a rock Pokemon. Really, really just... Try not to have your Slugma faint and evolve it right away because Slugma is frail as heck. There's only a few more Pokemon left. Snorlax cannot hit Ghost Pokemon. You have two options, Haunter or Mischievous. If you're playing in Gold and Silver or if you're playing in Crystal, you can manipulate both of them. You just need to know you might need Mischievous. It's easier to manipulate in Crystal because you just have to use Repel Strats to get a level 12 Paris. If you have a Paris due to Duplicates Clause, you can get a Mischievous guaranteed, I believe. And in Gold and Silver, it's Golduck or Psyduck you want to get out of the way. But yeah, if you have either Haunter or Mischievous, just teach a Curse or Keep Curse. Nothing Snorlax can do. Only two Pokemon remaining. Venusaur can do nothing to Crobat, so that's what we should use. There are many other options. You can use Vileplume if you so choose with Sludge Bomb. Heck, if you want to go like Arcanine or Typhlosion, I might still recommend taking Totodile, but there are many, many other options, but the best one is Crobat. Flying type like Dodrio, Fero, they would work fine too. Blastoise, I recommend Lantern. Resist Blizzard, Resist Surf, has Thunderbolt and Crystal. You're stuck with Spark in Gold and Silver because you don't get the Move Tutor. So I do recommend playing in Crystal. It's a little bit easier. There are some benefits like Ampharos if you're playing Gold and Silver, but the lack of Evolutionary Stones means you can't get Polyrath, another decent backup for earlier in the game I forgot to mention. Yeah, that's the team we want. And so Kanto, we have to accomplish two things. Beat the Gym Leaders quickly to, level, to get our level cap to increase and catch Slugma, catch Macargo. If you haven't caught a Haunter, catch one now. And then just try not to lose the core Pokemon. Now, if you're lazy and don't want to level up too many Pokemon, Janine is pretty easy with Haunter and Rhydon, which should be near the level cap. At least if you used Haunter a bunch, if you didn't level up your Haunter. After Janine, you have to do the whole Power Plant side quest, and then you can battle Brock. You can also get Super Rod, and you can just catch a Quillfish. Quillfish with Surf is actually usually enough to beat Brock. I got unlucky in my last run and had to use some really sketchy backup strats because Kabutops and Omastar, they're not weak to Surf and Quillfish doesn't have great special attack, but you can use Polyrath here by the way. That's another option. There are many, many options to be honest with you. Just a level 40 water Pokemon should be enough to knock out all of Brock's Pokemon. And once you've defeated Brock, you might start being able to use some Pokemon in your PC. Maybe not if you've leveled them up a lot. Hopefully you haven't lost Rhydon slash Graveler, whichever one you didn't use the Elite for. Makes Surge completely easy. Something goes wrong, Nidoking, Sand Slash. They're not as good because normal type moves like Self-Destruct, still a bit of a problem, but they can work in a pinch. And once you beat Surge, you should be good. For Sabrina, eventually, Houndoom should be used. For Erica, Houndoom and Macargo should do the trick. By the time you get to Blaine, you should have Lantern or Dugong. I recommend using Lantern, but Lantern should be back. 
Blue is a little tough. In order to beat Blue, I recommend going to the Elite Four. And oh my goodness, the Elite Four becomes super, super easy. Once you have a Houndoom, there's very little Will can do. Makargo can destroy Koga. And Kadabra, now that it's a higher level, just obliterates Lance. Ice Punch slash Thunder Punch one-shots or should, once you're high enough level, every single one of Lance's Pokemon. You can put XP Share on whatever else you want, and Kadabra can just destroy Lance consistently. You can go through the Elite Four again and again, and if you wanted to get to level 81 for red, you certainly could do that. You don't have to. The blue battle is stressful. The blue battle is stressful. We are going to use Kadabra, and it's the last time we're going to use Kadabra. You also can use Gyarados if you want. Blue's team is pretty tough. For blue, the level cap is 58, and by this point, the Nuzlocke has gotten a lot easier because you have so many Pokemon to pivot to. So, the way it worked out, as you saw, I had Graveler and Macargo take down Pidgeot, then came out Rhydon, which I know is going to use Earthquake so I can swap into Crobat, and then, since I know it's no longer going to use Earthquake, I can swap into Lantern. So you can kind of just guarantee Pokemon and moves. Executor doesn't know a Psychic move, so Crobat does work, and it walls the grass moves very well, the same thing it's going to do versus Venusaur. Just like Espeon, Kadabra can't really do much to a dark Pokemon, and by now, because we leveled up so much in the lead 4, Houndoom has Crunch, which is super effective, and Shadow Ball, which while not same type, in some cases does more damage. Arcanine is a little scary, but we can use Lantern, and if worse came to worse, Macargo, because it resists both Extreme Speed, which only has 5 Power Points, and Flamethrower. And with that, even though the level cap is 81, we are ready for red. We've already talked about how we're going to defeat him, but at such a low level, it is a little easier said than done. I had made it to red just once before, and I believe this was my 25th or 26th overall attempt. Most of my attempts, I would lose in Kanto because my team was bad, although many I did lose in Johto. It took a long time, but we're ready to finally finish this run. Because my Rhydon had fainted, I have to use Graveler. It does also know Earthquake, but unfortunately, since I didn't level up enough, it is a 2 KO. Although, since there's really nothing Pikachu can do, it doesn't really matter. Against Espeon, it's a little problematic. We can easily swap in Houndoom because it's going to go for Psychic. However, Crunch doesn't actually quite do half. And because of that, it actually comes pretty close to knocking out Houndoom. Now, this is the final battle, so we can afford to lose Pokemon. Thankfully, the math worked in our favor, and Houndoom was able to knock out Espeon. However, if we were just a few levels higher, we wouldn't have this scare. Because Houndoom is a fire type, Blastoise comes out next. Now, the smartest thing to do would be to just sacrifice Houndoom and then get the free swap in, but Houndoom served me well. So I'm going to swap into Lantern. There are two leftovers located in Kanto, and on Lantern, it's really powerful. So we're going to use Thunder Wave. It traps us with Whirlpool, which kind of sucks. But Thunderbolt's doing over a third. It's going to be a 3 KO. And with Thunder Wave, hopefully Blastoise will attack us less. With leftovers and the fact Lantern is relatively bulky, Blastoise isn't a problem. Venusaur is one of the easiest Pokemon ever. A lot of times it just goes for Solar Beam without Sunny Day and you can use Protect, but with Crobat, you don't even need to worry about that at all because double resist. Now, because we're at a lower level, Venusaur can do some damage to Crobat and we can confuse it. Unfortunately, Toxic isn't a possibility because of its typing, but with that, we only have two Pokemon left, Snorlax and Charizard. Snorlax comes out next and it's the easiest Pokemon on Red's team it literally cannot hit Mischievous or Haunter. It does no rest, so you probably want to use both Confusion Strats or have a move like Psychic and use Curse, just because otherwise it can take a really, really long time. But you're not going to have to worry. And then we've talked about Charizard. Macargo is just going to finish off the battle. Honestly, after about a month of doing these Nuzlocks, it felt really satisfying to have this team come together as well as it did. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how Nuzlocke's work in later generations, where the AI is better, but in some cases there is more or less team diversity, depending on the game we use. 
So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I did try to take some feedback and talk a little bit more about the successful run, but I do enjoy talking about these runs more generally. With that said, if we first try victory, it's going to be hard to do that. But with the way I play, that's going to be hard to do. All right, guys, I got to go back to making more videos. Thank you guys for watching. Take care.